The year is 1400. You and your comrades face a very tough challenge. You have to take down the ultimate fighting machine of the Middle Ages. In a fight like this, an ordinary weapon just won't do. You need something extreme, something truly bizarre. Now this type was known as the um, holy water sprinkler. Combines the techniques of a sword with the weight of an axe. It was called a golden tug, bill hook, crow's beak. How to win with weird weapons of the Middle Ages. Say hello to the knight in plate armor. 250 pounds of muscle and precision steel. Skilled with the broadsword, tested in battle, one of the finest fighting men in history. That is the medieval version of the tank. And he's coming towards us. So, how do we defeat him? Any ideas? Shoot an arrow at him. Yeah, well, we could fire an arrow at him if you were an extremely good shot with a very strong bow. At close range, the arrow might just penetrate that armour, but it's likely to bounce off him. How else? Come on, he's coming towards us. How else? Crossbow? Yeah, well, OK, there's a crossbow right there. Start winding it. It takes a minute to wind it up and load it. I don't think you've got time. Any other ideas? Come on, he's getting closer. How about a handgun? Handgun. OK, well, the medieval handgun was incredibly inaccurate. And you just missed him. And he's right here. He's got through. I think you can stop winding now, Finn. So what do we do? We have a knight in plaid armour standing in front of us. We need to know what weird weapons we can use to win against the plate armoured knight. The plate armoured knight was the terror of the Middle Ages. Time and again, armoured knights defeated hordes of unarmoured foot soldiers. They were such an awesome force that a handful of well-equipped men could defend a castle against an entire army. You have a number of choices against plate armour. You can crush it with something heavy, try and crack it open with an axe, or puncture it with a spike. Alternatively, you can try and pierce it with a short, sharp, stiff blade. Or you can go for the gaps. Every armour has them, areas that have to remain flexible and cannot be covered by plate. Unfortunately, there aren't very many of them. But you can try behind the knees, under the armpits, up and under the breastplate, or indeed any joints of the armour, including the visor. Every armour has a weakness. Somewhere. The trick, of course, is finding your opponent's weakness before he finds yours. So there he is. Any suggestions? We could push him over. Yeah, we could. I suppose if we got close enough to him, we might just be able to push him over. So let's try it. Now, he's used to wearing armour. He's worn it all his life. This armour is fitted to him and he's just going to get straight back up. Anything else? Hit him with a really big sword. We could do, yeah. There's a big sword over there. Hand it over. Let's see if that'll work. Now, first of all, if we want to hit him with something really big, we'll have to get close enough to do it, if he allows us to. So let's try it. Here we go. Of course, he's got his own sword, and it's a lot lighter than mine, so that's probably the last stroke that I am ever going to get to make. So, next idea. Would a really sharp sword go straight through the armor? Well, it might. So let's go and find out. All right, guys, this is a sharpened sword of modern steel, probably as good as anything they had. And here is a piece of plate armour, very thin plate armour, but Tim thinks that he can thrust this sword through that, so let's have a go. Put your goggles on. All right, here we go. This is a once only, Tim, get it right, yeah? Ready? Congratulations, Tim! At uh, arm's length, with two hands, with all your strength, you managed to puncture it by about an inch. In the meantime, <laughs> you've been hit three times by the man who's been wearing that plate armour, so I think, on the whole, we need to look for some other ideas, don't you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the evolution of specialised weapons actually began before plate armour was widely used. Until the 13th century, most knights wore a shirt of mail, woven out of interlocking iron rings. Chris, come on up here. Now, your opponent is a male armoured knight. He has a weapon. You have two choices. You either get a longer weapon than he has, in which case you can strike him without him striking you, or alternatively, you have to get inside that guard of his. So, for that, 
you need a shield. If you have a shield in your left hand, you can parry his weapon away and move in. Good, now you're close enough to hit him. So what are you going to hit him with? Well, several choices. Let's try this one. An axe. Now this is double-handed axe. It'll certainly go through that male armor, but there's no way you can use it with a single hand. So with a shield, you have to compromise. You have to use a smaller axe. Now that will go through him. Hit him in the shoulder. But even a small axe could be unwieldy and inaccurate, and it didn't have the versatility of a sword. So the armorers came up with the first weird weapon, the falchion, designed to help you win against male armor. Now the falchion, it's a very interesting weapon, combines the techniques of a sword with the weight of an axe. All the weight is behind here, behind the point of percussion. Now this means that it was an extremely effective weapon against male, could cleave right through it. Question is, how good was it against plate armor? Not very. Maybe we should try something else. Another adaption of the sword was this late medieval broadsword. It's much shorter than the old cutting sword, and it tapers to this extremely sharp point. This is a magnificent weapon, but it needs to be made of the highest quality steel, otherwise it will shatter in combat. The most extreme version was this, the estoc. A purely thrusting weapon, designed for thrusting into the gaps of armour. But thrusting swords like the Estoc were only good if you were well trained and highly skilled. In the heat of battle, you might need something a little more basic. One of the most unexpected weapons of the Middle Ages was also one of the simplest, the wooden club. Apply a bit of technology and you get this, the mace usually made of steel, between four and six pounds, with these longitudinal ribs on the end. Now, these would make sure that any blow against an unarmoured man would be deadly. It would also increase the effectiveness of any blow against plate. These came in various styles. You could have spherical and oval ones with spikes, and even very fancy ones like this. This was a knight's weapon for use against other knights. <laughs> The mace was an extremely aggressive weapon, but to use it effectively, you had to get in close. You could even deflect the occasional sword stroke. It is usually used with a small shield. Medieval battles often developed into massive crushes as the rear ranks piled in behind. And in these circumstances, the mace was the ideal weapon to have. This man is at my mercy. But wait, now I have to ask myself a question. Not how do I finish him off, but who is he? Why does it matter? You'll find out in a minute. Here's where we left off. This man is at my mercy. But who is he? So why does it matter? Well, if the man on the ground is a knight from a wealthy family, you want to keep him alive. You can get big money if he or his family pay a ransom for his safe return. On the other hand... If this is a man at arms, not a knight, then he's a dangerous beast, and he could recover at any moment. You're in the middle of a battle here, he's surrounded by his colleagues. You could keep bashing him, but he might roll over, even grab your weapon, so you have to act fast. The moment he's down, you've got to be on him. With this. Now this is where it gets really nasty. Every knight carried one of these. A dagger, purely stabbing weapon, called a misericord. It was called the Dagger of Mercy. That's because... When you were about to stab him, he could plead for mercy. Mercy! And if you weren't interested, you could stab him in the face. Or if his visor was down, you could simply stab him straight through the ice slot. Ah! Or you could find a way into the armor, through the plates, under the armpit, and into the oh! armor. Alternatively, find some gap in the breast plates and squeeze it in that way. Ah! There, is, there is one more alternative, but that doesn't bear thinking about. The mace was a good weapon, but you might need repeated blows to actually knock down a well-armoured man. So how do you get the same effect with a single strike? The answer is the flail. The flail was an agricultural tool of ancient origin. It was a wooden club hinged by rope or chain to a long staff. Usually it was used for threshing corn. 
but replace the wooden club with an iron one and you could use it for thrashing men. Six feet long with a two-foot swingle, the Great Flail was especially popular in Eastern Europe and Russia. But it really came into its own as a single-handed weapon. The military flail, also known as the ball and chain, came in many varieties. Uh, this one here, here is a double-handed one with a spiked weight on the end. This will uh, increase the impact of the stroke enormously. An alternative is this one. Extremely heavy, very nasty. Two spiked balls here. With these heavy weights on the end, this will be very unmanageable. You need at least two hands to use it. So the usual one is this. Very simple, short haft, some kind of safety chain or rope for your hand because these are very easy weapons to lose in combat. A short haft, a staple attached to a chain, attached to the spiked weight. Now this type is known as the um, holy water sprinkler. Very amusing. Helmet, please. Now, as you will find in practice, this is an extremely dangerous weapon. Not just for your opponent. In fact, you're far more likely to hit yourself with one of these, if you don't know what you're doing, than to hit anyone else. Now, the flail can strike with enormous impact, but it can also strike you, so you have to keep your arm extended. You need at least one swing to get up to power, and once you're up to speed, paradoxically, it's easier to control at high speed than at low. If you ever stop it, you lose control of it. You've got to keep that ball swinging. So, let's have a go. The flail is a terrifying weapon to face. Not only do you have to watch the man, you have to watch that constantly circling ball. Now you can avoid it. Ah! or deflect it, or try and get under it. But it's rather like waiting for a bus. Just when you're not expecting it, one comes along. Or two, or three. Oh. Now it's my turn. As good as it is, the flail isn't perfect. It's a lousy defensive weapon, and if you stop swinging it, even for a second, that's all your opponent needs. Oh! 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 What's worse, it's absolutely exhausting. Another alternative weapon is the hammer. The wooden mallet was a tool for the peasant and for the common soldier. It could also be a pretty handy weapon. The knightly version was the war hammer. This was an excellent weapon. You could crack armor with this side. The hammerhead was often serrated so that it would bite into the armor, not glide off it. And on this side, a long, narrow spike that could puncture plate. Here's another one, all steel, looking like a can opener. These spikes were known as the bec de corbin, the crow's beak. And they were light enough for the old one, two. One, two. This type was called a plasson, with a single or double curved spike. Looked exactly like an ice pick, and is extremely efficient. Of course, the problem with all armor-piercing weapons is that you only get one chance to get it right, because <laughs> they get completely stuck <laughs> in the armor! That's the problem with alternative weapons. Just when you think you've got a winner, there's a new hitch. But no one said defeating an armored knight would be easy. In a moment, we go long and lean with a high-tech spear and a lethal tree trimmer. As we've seen, most weird weapons were inspired by existing weapons that couldn't quite do the job. The spear is a good example. Against plate armor, it was ineffective and the wooden shaft made it very vulnerable. What the common foot soldier needed was a weapon that could make him a match for those men-at-arms in their highly expensive armor. Now, the spear was virtually useless for that, but he could try this, the Aalspies, the eel spear. Now, this has an armor-piercing point on the end of a very long, slender steel blade with this rondel here to give you some protection. Now, this was a magnificent weapon. The advantage of the Aalspies was that you could aim for the cracks and the chinks in the plate armor. 
Or you could try and pierce right through it. Now, with the arse piece, you could keep coming back. Because this long steel blade was not easy to break. The disadvantages were that it was an extremely heavy weapon. And all the weight at the business end. You couldn't have a shield with it because you needed both hands. Which meant that you had to absolutely commit yourself to the blow. And if you failed... Ah! The odds seemed stacked against the common foot soldier. What he needed was a weapon that could cut, thrust and chop at the same time. So, he found one. The billhook was an agricultural tool with a long hooked blade. It is still used today for hedging and lopping branches. As a weapon, it is of great antiquity. It was used by some of Alexander the Great's infantry. This was the medieval version of the billhook. A long single-edged blade which curved into a hook, a spike at the end, and a fluke on the back ridge of the blade. This was the most popular medieval polearm, relatively easy to make, and used throughout Europe. This is the medieval bill hook. Now, we infantry, we're not armed in plate like you guys. We may have leather and cloth and jacks and maybe some mail if we're really pretty well equipped, but nothing like the sort of technology that you've got on your fronts and backs. But at least we've got this weapon. This can be made by a good, skilled local blacksmith. The blade itself divided into these three, the spike, the hook, the fluke at the back. Step forward a minute. There's something about armor which you will immediately notice as you're walking, which is that it gets caught in things. There's lots of bits sticking out, lots of cracks that you can hook into yeah, and just catch. So there's the, the elbows there, there's the shoulders here, there's bits of the body itself that you can hook into. And there, you've got him like a fish. Now, of course, you have to get close enough to be able to do that, so what you want to do first is hit him hard, either with the spike, it'll go straight through armor if you hit him hard enough, or alternatively, you can use the fluke at the back. At high speed, would go straight through that armor. Or say that you were riding by me on a horse, so I'm down here as an infantryman, ride by me and I can sweep you straight out of your saddle. Now, you can use the butt against armor like that to push someone back. You can swing it around just to keep them at a distance. So, it's a pretty good all-round weapon, but frankly, against a really good swordsman, you're not gonna have much of a chance. Now, I could parry you, cut to my head. I could parry you there, but I'm completely exposed. Do it again. So I need to at least do that and clear it, yeah? Uh, the problem is that you're gonna come straight back cutting at me, so let's have a little routine here. We go to the head, I'm gonna clear it, straight back in the middle, there. All right, now, I chose to parry because I thought he was gonna give me a cut. He wasn't, he was gonna give me the thrust. So I'm dead. You can see my problem. I can only make one mistake. Our arsenal of weird weapons is just about complete, so maybe it's time for a short review. First, the falchion. Then, the mace. Followed by the flail. The hammer and the crow's beak. The arlspies. The billhook. They're all good, but are they good enough to help our team win its challenge against the plate-armored knight? This is one of the weirdest weapons of the Middle Ages. A long club fitted with iron spikes. It was a traditional weapon, roughly made by local blacksmiths. It was called a Godentag, which means good day. The Flemish must have had a sense of humor. As they hit their opponents, they would say, Godentag. It was used for thrusting, Godentag. For striking, Godentag. And for slashing open the flanks of horses, Godentag. <laughs> Very nasty. How nasty? Well, in 1302, at the Battle of Portray, a magnificent French army came face to face with the Flemish Godendag. This absolutely simple, homemade weapon, wielded by untrained peasants and shopkeepers, was up against mailed, mounted knights of the finest army in Europe. So, who would you put your money on? If you bet on the French, you lost. The Flemish peasants carried the day. In the right hands, the Godendag is indeed a fearsome weapon. But there's only one sure way to win against a plate armored knight. 
This is where it all began. Remember? Before we had the arsenal of weird weapons, our team would have had little chance against this armored knight. But now, against three knights, with a little help from the Godentag, the Flail, the Crow's Beak, and a few friends, well, it's hardly a fight at all. Our team have learned how to win against the armored knight. But all the weapons we've seen in action have one thing in common. No matter how weird and wonderful the weapon, what matters is the man behind it. There was a time, deep in history, when early man began his dominance of nature. What separated us from all the other animals? What protected us from wild beasts and from each other? What single factor helped us not just to survive as a species, but to triumph? You may not like the answer. Weapons. Now we have to find out how our primitive ancestors beat the odds in the battle of the species. We'll learn how to win with Stone Age weapons. All right, guys, Sean, if you come over here, Kristen, over there. Here are two magnificent specimens of the human animal, right? But you have very few advantages compared to other animals. Size, you're not big enough to scare them off. Speed, you can't outrun them. You haven't the strength to fight with them. You don't have sharp teeth or claws. You don't even have a shell to hide in. Physically, you are completely useless. But what have you got? Brains. Well, some of us have more than others, but yeah, brains. And our ancestors used their brains to make two vital evolutionary advances. One was to use fire, the other was to use tools, and some of the earliest tools were weapons. And our challenge is to learn how to win with Stone Age weapons. And when we've gained some knowledge, we're going to use that knowledge to go out hunting, all right? So I'm going to send you out there now into the wild, and I want you to find some natural materials to bring back here and to make weapons with. To be honest, we've given the team some modern hatchets and saws to do the job. After all, we need to squeeze several hundred thousand years of progress into a single 30-minute time slot. Most of our team have gone for the first weapon of all, the wooden stick. It seems simple, but not any old stick will do. Early man was forced to assess which kinds of wood were better than others, and just how he would use his new weapon. If he chose a straight piece like this, he'd have a light and handy weapon. But for hunting and killing, he'd need something heavier, preferably with all the weight at one end. Now, this would be good for clubbing and also for throwing. And it's mainly throwing weapons that our team are collecting. Of course, man's brain allowed him to do more than just pick up sticks off the forest floor. Our team's brains are serving them likewise. Using the simple tools we've given them, they are modifying their finds to make what they think will work as weapons. Early man did the same thing using stone tools. It simply took him longer to finish the job. OK, so here we have an entire arsenal of the earliest, most primitive weapons. We've got a lot of different sorts of clubs here. Here's a weird-looking one. Whose is this? I can say with confidence that our team is at least on the right track. Some of their found objects seem wonderful for bashing. What a horrible mind you have. There we have the basic bone club. Others are clearly intended to cut and stab. There's this, which was just picked up off the ground. Um, this is, I don't know, a jawbone or something. And there's one over here, which was clearly made by a sadist. <laughs> <laughs> Who's responsible for this? That would be me. <laughs> OK, I'm going to have to keep out of your way. Got a nice sharp point there. The problem is you've made it out of dead wood. That's going to snap in no time at all. Now, we have to start using our brains because our survival as a species depends on us getting these weapons right. So, let's pick up the weapons and go and find a target and see if they work. Here we go. We are ten paces away from our target, which is made from a couple of hay bales covered with animal hide. 
We are pitching our clubs and spears to see what kind of damage we might have done to a real animal at a time when our ancestors depended on this sort of thing if they wanted to eat. All right. Look at this lot. I think you could honestly say that we are completely useless at this, right? Of all of those weapons, only two actually hit and pierced the target. So what went wrong? Despite our team's hard work and their performance as brave Stone Age hunters, their weapons were neither sharp enough nor strong enough to do the job. Now to learn what they must do to fix the problem. We have to find a way of making these points sharper. And for that, we need fire. So I want you two to go away and make some fire for us. There's one more thing, which is that we're supposed to be in the Stone Age, people. Where's the stone? Early man's first weapons were wood and stone, especially flint and this glass-like rock called obsidian. Some flakes of stone can be amazingly sharp, and some blocks of it occur naturally in an easily handled D shape, with one rounded edge and one sharp. Man discovered he could make other useful shapes on demand, just by knocking a hard stone against flint. Working with stone in this way is known as napping, and using this new technique, our ancestors created one of their most important early inventions, the hand axe. The hand axe is a tool designed to fit into a man's hand. It's an all-purpose implement for um, cutting, chopping up wood, carving up game, scraping flesh from hides. It's also extremely good for um, preparing breakfast. Two of our team members are now busy with their fire-making project, but rubbing stones together simply will not do. Instead, I'm going to offer them a different tool. Here is a bow drill. This is the base. The idea is to cause as much friction as possible in that base and uh, create fire that way. So in order to make some embers, we rub that really hard, put some moss around there so that'll catch fire. Put this little top on there so we can hold it. And if you put your foot on there so it doesn't move, all right, let's try this. Here we go. Now, this takes some time, so I'm going to let you do it. All right. Starting a fire is very difficult. The friction has to heat the wood to 800 degrees before it will start to smolder. The bow drill string is made of twisted sinew and was one of early man's ingenious uses of animals. Every dead creature had a huge number of byproducts for Stone Age man. The larger bones provided ready-made clubs, sharp antlers, horns or teeth could all become weapons, and strips of sinew and hide were both very useful. But fire Good, was man's greatest Excellent. tool well of all. So here's where we are. We've made our own hand axes, which were used to sharpen our wooden spears. Next, we harden the points in our fire and hone them by rubbing them against stone. But there's more to a spear than a fire-hardened point. Which designs work best? Short spears may be good for stabbing, but our team can see that longer spears, even crude ones, are better for throwing. Throwing the spear at an elevation gives it tremendous speed and force as it falls. But hitting a moving animal requires skill, practice and patience. We'll now give it a try on our own hunting grounds. All right, are we ready for this? Yeah! All-out assault. Our families are starving. We haven't eaten for days. There is dinner. Are we ready? Ready. ready. Let's go! Coming up, who survives, the team or their prey? Our team have become Stone Age hunters, using the crudest of wooden weapons to attack wild game on the open plain. All right, all right, hold it there. So we've got to our bear here, and we've got our hand axes ready to carve him up. The problem is the bear isn't hurt at all. <laughs> all right, those of us who did manage to hit our friendly creature here wouldn't have pierced through his hide. Primitive man is ready for his next giant step forward, the application of technology. Early man 
had to find a way to make his weapons more effective. Now, as he was working with his hand axes, he must have noticed these shards of stone, really sharp. Now, out of these, he could create blades and points of all types. As his skill improved, he could produce flakes of stone up to a foot long. Now, these would be kept sharpened at one end, and the other blunt end would be wrapped in hide to create a basic dagger. With time, the working of stone became a true art, and the master craftsmen of prehistory produced a wide variety of blades and points, finished to an astonishing level of detail and beauty. I keep saying how razor-sharp stone can be, and to prove it, I need a shave. Now, we usually try and avoid bloodshed in this program, but this time it may be unavoidable. Ah, well, it's not very comfortable, but at least it works. This is a breakthrough. Early man can shave. And what's more, he now had the means to make a whole new armory by combining all the techniques that he'd learnt. And our team are emulating their ancestors, using bindings, natural glues and wood to create stone-tipped weapons more lethal than anything that had come before. Some weapons probably came about by accident. Now, if you want a fire to burn better, you blow on it. It's much better to blow underneath it, so you get a hollow piece of bamboo, you shove it in and you blow on it. And then something gets stuck in your piece of bamboo, so you blow it out. Ow. And hey, you've invented the pea shooter. And then someone gets a really brilliant idea. He cuts a bamboo, hollows it out, makes a small projectile with a flint point, binds some material to one end, and he has invented the blowpipe and dart. <laughs> and while the first victim may have been the butt of laughter, things took a more serious turn when the dart was covered with one of the natural poisons man was also finding out about. Turning a practical joke into a lethal weapon. But our team have spent most of their time making spears, and there's still much to improve upon. Now, we all agreed we had to get more range with our spears, right? Now, early man could see how a sling worked, and he was beginning to understand basic aerodynamics. So, first he tried tying his sling onto the spear as a sort of throwing strap to get more velocity. He could also try getting a piece of hide and wrapping it in a spiral around the spear. Now, when he threw it like this, it made the spear spin, which made it fly straighter. These uh, flights and feathers on the butt, these were a good idea too. But the best idea of all is this. Now, this little thing is a spear thrower. It's called an atle atle. This is how it works. This little hook goes into the notch at the base of the spear. You remember how we found it difficult even reaching that target before? Well, this little machine increases velocity up to five times. Have a look at this. Though it is not easy to master, the team catches on to use of the spear thrower quickly. By exerting force through a longer arc than the arm can provide, it casts the spear further than ever before. Now we have a whole new world of technology and experience being applied to our weapons. Our bear is in serious trouble. But who are we kidding? Your ancestors did not use these weapons just for hunting animals. They used them to kill each other. Stone Age Man at War, coming up. All right, come on, you guys. You are going to war. We're going to make you savages. Now, most primitive societies find the idea of organized warfare completely incomprehensible. It's a waste of time, it's a waste of resources, but it seems likely that as the human population grew, pressure increased on territory for hunting. Now, fighting techniques. Every weapon has its own. In just a few moments of combat with these, you'll find out what works and what doesn't work. Most of the weapons we've made for ourselves are purely aggressive. They have very little defensive capabilities, but a skilled fighter could at least parry an incoming blow with your spear. Give me a thrust. And you give me a, a cut to the head with your club. But most of us aren't skilled and we're not aggressive, so we'll want some kind of protection. 
We've gathered some natural materials, and your next job is to make yourself some shields and some body armor. Go on, get going. Early man had no metal, so he depended on nature to provide materials for his armor. A suit of reeds, for example, was light and flexible. It could withstand a blow from a club, but not a thrust from a spear. Animal hides stretched over a frame made very good shields. If thick enough, they could stop almost anything in the Stone Age arsenal. Straight away, we're faced with one of the basic problems of personal combat. You can carry a shield, you can wear body armor, but it increases your weight. The more weight you have, the less agile you are, and you lose offensive ability. It's a balance. Now, there's something else that these uh, shields do very well. I'll show you. Sean, stand over there, will you? Now, usually, a missile weapon is the best thing to have, but not anymore. I want you to throw that spear at me. Come on, throw it right at me. Right, now I have a shield. I can defend myself against missile weapons. It forces me to get in close and dirty, so that's the kind of fighting we'll be learning, all right? When fighting at close quarters, the Stone Age warrior had to instantly adapt. Each opponent could have different weapons and defenses, so each situation called for different strategies. Well, that's good, excellent. That's very nice. All right, now, but you've got to be careful because I'm going to come back as soon as I can, hitting that shield, and it's not a strong shield, so come to my shoulder. Ah, ah, all right, I have an advantage, which is that, whoa, that I'm nice and light, whereas you are uh, pretty heavy. OK, so I can get in close. You can hit really hard, all right? OK, and high, too. There, yeah? So when are you going to hit him? Hit him hard, 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 hard. Yeah? You've got to be savage. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Have another go. We don't know how often it happened, but combat between Stone Age men must have been absolutely brutal. To look at them now, we would call them savages, even if our own times have produced weapons that can wipe out every one of us in a single day. It's time to get back to the main reason man needed his weapons, to hunt animals. Shields and armor are useless to the prehistoric hunter. Speed and surprise are vital. Our image of hunters is male, but there are two women in our group, and in the mythology of many societies, the goddess of hunting was female. All right, guys, gather your weapons. You are all going on a bear hunt. Now, it's not physical strength that catches game, it's skill. What skills do you need? First, you have to learn to move and hide in absolute silence. But there are snakes and mountain lions out here, so watch out. Second, you have to get in close. We've discovered that these weapons have a very short range. Third, you're all very smelly. It's not a joke. You have to stay downwind of your target. If he gets downwind, he will be hunting you and not the other way around. Fourth and most important, you have to plan your hunt as a group. That's the only way human beings can survive out here, as a group. You must ambush him together. You must hit him with every weapon you've got all at once. You have one major advantage. The bear that you are hunting will be me. Come this way. Somewhere in the depths of a Stone Age forest, our team is on a bear hunt. I have volunteered to be the bear, and their challenge is to find a proper place to ambush me as a group. That is the only way early man could successfully cut down prey using his primitive short-range weapons. They are looking for somewhere with plenty of cover and a good view of the approaches. My eyesight is better than a bear, but my sense of smell is pathetic. And in dense woodland, that's much more important. In situations like this, you have to rely on instinct. So, let's see if I can find them before they get me. The team finds a clearing, ideal for an ambush. Now they must work out how to lure me into it. They spread out, but I have no idea what they're planning. They're out there somewhere. They can probably hear me coming. You remember the thrill of hide-and-seek? How kids love to jump out and surprise you? Well, that thrill is rooted deep within us. 
Suddenly we discover skills and sensitivities that most of us never use, but are still there, lying dormant within us from our earliest evolution. The team knows they have to corner me to get close enough for their weapons to make a kill. They could be anywhere, and my gut tells me they are nearby. A bear would have smelled them by now, but I continue to depend on my eyesight. I see you! we put the bear in, I think I'd be dead. Come on. If you've seriously injured our bear, these flint blades would have really ripped into him. You'd have to follow him now and wait till he bleeds to death, poor beast. But you'd get him in the end. And you, with the decoy. I got up there, I thought I'd escape from you, and I'd come straight down here into your traps. Very good. The plan worked. Well done. You win. <laughs> <laughs> We've learned how to make our own weapons and how to win as a Stone Age man in the hunt and in That's combat. Ah, ah. These are the same lessons that our ancestors had to learn for real. Their only hope of survival lay in the defeat of all the forces of nature raised against them. And the only things that stood between them and extinction were their brains and their weapons. <laughs>